one of us has to stand up all okay. the time. <laughs> so first of all, uh, really happy to be here today. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, it is such an honor for us to be here with you guys today and to talk a little bit about what we do and what astronomy is in the UAE and all of the fun things that we are up to these days. So just a quick introduction. Uh, we already got a really nice introduction from the chairman, but just to recap a little bit. My name is Khadija. I am the operations manager at Dubai Astronomy Group, and this is our general manager, Mr. Shiraz. So just to give you guys a brief about what Dubai Astronomy Group is, what we do in general, where we are, all of the information about it. Can we go to that? Here we are. No one after that? Goodbye. So Dubai Astronomy Group is a nonprofit organization that started in the year 2000 by this guy right here. So this is our CEO, Mr. Hassan Al Harimi who started this group out of his own passion for astronomy. And this was many, many years ago when I was still a baby. So he started this group with, uh, it was like a group of amateurs and astronomy enthusiasts who were really in love with the skies, really in love with what the UAE had to offer. And they would constantly go to the desert and learn about the sky. They would observe and stargaze all throughout the night. That group, very quickly grew into hundreds, then thousands of people who would go with them to the desert and learn about these things. And Mr. Hassan himself started teaching about these things as he was learning them himself. And I was lucky enough to be one of the kids who were attending this event way back when I was a child. So I would attend these incredible events with them in the middle of the night, go to a random place, in the middle of nowhere, desert, and spend the whole night with telescopes and astronomers, learn about the sky and everything. And then the next day I had to go to school and no one believed me that I was actually doing this because <laughs> no one believed this kind of stuff even existed. They were like, what do you mean you're in the desert? Doing what? <laughs> but that later became a passion of mine because I was like, okay, this thing is just phenomenal. And it's, it's like, it's unbelievable that I'm actually doing this and it's happening here. So you can see some of the images of the events that we do in the desert. These are the more advanced trips that we are doing basically. So the group grew quite a bit. The number of people was huge. We had several camps. We had the Zubair camp, which is outskirts of Sharjah. Yeah, um, Sharjah, pretty much on the border of Sharjah and Ajman. Yes. So we used to do a lot of our events there, very remote location, great for doing these kinds of kinds of events. And then later we moved to Dubai where we started our ancillary astronomy center. It is currently temporarily closed. Hopefully it opens back up soon. So we have our observatory there. We have a lot of uh, scientific labs, uh, lots of uh, things that families can come to. Anybody who's interested even a little bit about astronomy or space or just wants to have a fun weekend with the family can come to the center, enjoy these events. And then in the winter times, not in the summer, we take people to the desert where they get to do a lot of fun activities like observe meteor showers, comets, uh, planets, all sorts of things. So we take people to the desert to stargaze with us and the mountains as well, which hopefully there are upcoming events and we would love to have all of you join us for those events. Now, the activities of Dubai Astronomy Group is endless from the amount of things that they do. We work with schools, we go to conferences, we work with tourism companies, we work with private companies, government companies, you name it. Anything and everything related to astronomy or space we have some kind of hand in that. Now, I will give the floor to Mr. Shiraz to go a little bit more into what is astronomy, what's happening in the UAE, how can we observe these things, and all of the details about that. Great. Thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, as uh, Adisha mentioned, my name is Shiraz, Shiraz Nazir Khandawan. I'm the general manager at the Dubai Astronomy Group. And, uh, First and foremost, a uh, big thank you to the Dubai Astronomy History Group for having us here, for 
of this session. Um, before I get started, I, the things that I'll be talking to you about will be the astronomy side of things as we have uh, seen them in the UAE and a bit of history of uh, astronomy in our region and uh, a bit more on the perspective of astronomy as to how it, in my opinion, at least how it affects uh, all of us. So before I get into that, one very quick question. So we're all here for a session in astronomy. Yes? Yes. Okay, so that's not the question. Um, <laughs> the question is, why? Anybody? <laughs> why are we here for a session on astronomy? You've taken valuable time out to be here today for astronomy. Why? Curiosity, yes. By the way, no wrong answers. Everybody's got their own reasons. I just like to get a feel of what people are anticipating from what I'm about to talk about. It's a little, nope. little bit more about people who enjoy gazing up the wonders. Get to know a little bit more about people, curiosity. What else? Anybody? There's so much to learn about it. There is so much to learn about it, absolutely. And all of these that we are talking about, these are all true. I mean, these are not entirely unique to us. See, as we are sitting over here talking about the night sky, this is actually not something new. This is something that people have been doing for thousands of years around the world. Every single civilization had their own version of astronomy, had their own version as to how they observed and what they felt about the night sky. So some civilizations, when they looked at the night sky, they would assume that perhaps what we are looking at are our ancestors who died and have become stars and are now looking out for us. Some would say that perhaps these are ancient kings who are looking out for their nations. A very prominent theory in the Arabic region, something like 5,000 years ago, was that perhaps what we are looking at are actually travelers and other caravans who are sitting around their bonfire and looking at us how we're looking at them. And there's a reason why they went with the whole theory of travelers. And it's because to them, the night sky seemed to be moving. It would be much, much later on that we would realize that this moving night sky was actually the rotation of the Earth, which created the illusion of the moving night sky. Would you guys like to see it? Okay. Let me just simulate the night sky for you guys over here with a little bit of this. Go. So, So this is what the night sky is like right now. Believe you're sharing the presentation. And let me change that. Just a second. Can you share? Yes. Thank you. Okay. So this is what the night sky is like right now. Does it make any sense? Yeah. From what point of view? From whatever you're looking at. Dubai. In Dubai. This is, yes, from, this is in Dubai. My bad. This is what the night sky is like in Dubai right now. This is a simulation which we, uh, it's a software, anybody can get it. It's a very good simulation. Um, does it begin to make a little bit more sense now? And what about now? <laughs> All right, so these are, what we are looking at over here are basically constellations that uh, we created, but 
let's look at the moving night sky. I'm going to switch off the atmosphere because this is a software and that is something which I can do. And it makes the night sky much, much more clear. And let's move things around, shall we? So as time goes by, this is how the night sky seems to be moving. And the ancients noticed this. And they noticed one very important thing. They noticed that the entire sky seemed to be moving, except this one point. As a matter of fact, it seemed as if everything seemed to be moving around this one point. Any guesses as to what this is? Sorry, that is correct. This is the star by the name of Polaris, which is also known as the North Star. Fun fact, it does seem to move, but only if we speed things up. Okay, um, I'm going to speed things up. It's going to get a little bit janky. So this is a little faster. I intend to, yes. But then you see that movement. That movement is what I was referring to. There is. Okay. So today we understand that the reason why this point in the sky does not move is because this is where Earth's axis points to. Back then, they did not have this information, but what they did realize is that if I was facing this star, which for example, I am right now, I would be facing the direction which we today refer to as north, which means that what is behind me? Good, on my right, on my right, <laughs> and on my left, we have west, all right? One more very cool thing about this is that if you start following this, you will end up in the Northern Emirates. Charja, Rasul Tema, follow this star, it'll take you there. And as a matter of fact, if you continue to follow this and like really follow this, I mean, perhaps go all the way up to, let's say Europe, the location of where you observe this star changes. So if I were to look at this star from Dubai, for the next 365, 700, 1000, 2000 days, my angle of measurement of this star will remain pretty much the same. That is because that is what my latitude is. So if I move further up on the globe, if I move towards, let's say, Europe, my angle of observation will change. And so much so that it will come to a point where the North Star is right above my head. Where am I standing? So we're standing at the North Pole. And similarly, if I started walking south, it will go lower in the night sky. So much so that it will reach the horizon and then disappear. Where am I standing? Very good. Usually people say South Pole. You did not fall for it. <laughs> so, uh, yes, you're standing at the equator because the North Star is something which is only visible in the Northern Hemisphere. This is perhaps also why it became so famous because most of the major work that got famous in the world of astronomy was done by people in the Northern Hemisphere. You've got the Chinese, you've got the Greeks, you've got the Aztec, you've got the Arabs. And that made the North Star one of the most popular uh, stars out there. Now, using these stars, the ancients started developing markers. As a matter of fact, they started developing stories. For example, one of the most famous stories 
in the Arabic region is the story of Suhail. Suhail is a very prominent star in uh, the Arabic culture, so much so that they designed an entire calendar called the Durur calendar based on the sighting of this star, which would become visible roughly around the 23rd of August in this region. So from that point, they would count 100 days and then 100 more and then another 100. You've got 300 days, then 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 60 days and then five more and then 365 days were complete. What I mean by a practical calendar is that they had defined slots that during these dates we will go fishing and we can expect this kind of fish to be available in the sea. During these dates, we can go for harvest, we can go for pearl diving, we can expect this kind of a bird flying south, so on and so forth. And they designed their entire lives based on the correlation that they saw between what was happening on Earth with what they saw in the sky. Keep in mind, I'm not referring to astrology. I'm talking about astronomy. The correlation that they saw is very similar to that of the sea turtle, that when they see the full moon is when they go to lay their eggs. The moon doesn't tell the sea turtle anything. To be fair, the moon doesn't tell anybody anything. It's just that the correlation is what they created with what they saw on Earth and what they saw in the night sky. And then they created stories. So coming back to the story of Sohail. The story of Sohail goes as follows. There's a gentleman by the name of Sohail who has done pretty well for himself, lives in a small town. And now he wants to get settled down. He's looking for a suitable partner to share the rest of his life with him. So he approaches one of the town elders, a man named Nash. By the way, there are many versions of this story. This is the version which I like best. I'll tell you why. So he approaches a gentleman by the name of Nash who has three daughters. He proposes for the hand for marriage for one of his daughters. However, Nash refuses the proposal. And so he is heartbroken. But the very next day, Nash has been found murdered. And obviously, everybody begins to blame Suhail that you propose for marriage, he refused your proposal, you made it a matter of your honor, and therefore you feel this for man. So to save himself and his family from what we can only refer to as mob justice, Suhail runs away with his two sisters to the other side of town to escape all of this. Whereas the daughters of Nash, also referred to as Banat and Nash, they know that the killer is not Suhail. They know that the killer is their neighbor, Jelly, who has had a dispute with their father for some time, and he has now finally murdered him. So the daughters of Nash, the Banat and Nash, they haul the coffin of their father and start going around the house of Jelly, seeking justice. The end. I know what you're thinking. What just happened? What happened to Sohail? Did they get justice? The story, this version of the story, is completely silent on that. It has a very abrupt ending. And the reason it has an abrupt ending is so that it remains as an itch in the brain. It lingers in your mind and you tend to remember what has happened. Let me just showcase to you what I was referring to in this story. So we've got our cardinal points here. And let's go to Feb when we actually have these guys visible. Okay. So this over here, this is a star by the name of Cannabis. In modern Western astronomy, 
it is known as cannabis. But this is the star that we're referring to as Sohail. Sohail has his two sisters, Sirius and Prosyan. His two sisters are known as Sharia Yamani and Sharia Shami in the story. Sharia Yamani, Sirius, if you were to mark the point from where this star rises and follow that path, this will lead you to the road to Yemen. Sharia Shami, if you were to mark this point, the point where this star sets, it will lead you to the road that takes you to Bilad Sham, which was a much bigger area back then, but is still referred to as Syria today. So these are the three characters on the other side of the town, whereas we have the Ash right over here. This star, this constellation, let's look at this, this one over here, seven stars. This is also famously known as the Big Dipper or the Spoon or the Bear. But in this story, it is referred to as Nash and Banat Nash. So this over here, this box, yeah, this is Nash's coffin, which is being hauled around by his three daughters right here. Around the house of Jenny the North Star. And if you will look at it once again, you will see that this constellation goes around this point all the time. Now, why is the Big Dipper important? So, two reasons. Number one, the Big Dipper is actually one of the constellations that allows you to find the North Star. Because contrary to what we have, some of us have, or at least I have, uh, I have been taught in school, the North Star is not the brightest star in the sky. The North Star is actually very faint. It is visible, but it's very faint. Sirius is the brightest star in the sky. I'm assuming that our educators mentioned that this was the brightest star because this is the one star that is visible in all seasons. Summer, winter, whatever it may be, it is always going to be visible. Sirius, not so much. Any other star for that matter, not so much, at least amongst the bright ones. So the Big Dipper is actually something that you use to find the North Star. So you take the top, the first two stars over here in the Big Dipper, and you draw a straight line and come to Polaris, the North Star. Whereas the entirety of the constellation is actually something that you can use to be able to tell time in the night. By measuring its movement, you can tell how much time has gone by. I think, if I'm not mistaken, something like 5 to 10 degrees every one hour. So these are the points that the ancients used in this particular story. Now, the question is, why create these stories? And the answer is actually quite simple. Back then, they did not have metrics. They did not have computers. They did not have mobile phones. Telling stories was a form of entertainment there would be special days that people would go to the market. There would be special sections that people would go to and recite poetry, tell stories. It was a corner of literature. And perhaps it was also something that they could recount on as to how they grew up. Because these are not just stories that people developed and left. These are stories which were passed on from generation to generation. These are stories which grandmothers told their grandchildren. And most importantly, these stories were created as mnemonic devices. It helped you remember what it is that you're looking for. This is an example which I love to give every single time. 
only I can find constellation of Orion. Should be right here. Where does it work? This over here is the constellation of Orion. This one right here. All right. These three stars are, in my opinion, the most famous stars in the constellation of Orion. Does anybody know which stars these are? This is what is referred to as the Orion's Belt, which got very famous after the movie Men in Black. Everybody, almost everybody, refers to these three stars as Orion's Belt. My wife is not one of them. She refers to these three stars as herself and her two other friends. And I'm an astronomer. And she continues to do so. And nobody from the International Astronomical Union has ever come to stop her from doing that. Because quite frankly, it doesn't matter. Those stories are something that we created. There isn't actually a hunter in the sky. There isn't actually a scorpion or Sohail or a murder that was committed. These are basically stories that we created. This, these three stars is a story for herself that she has created. Perhaps to have a better connection with the universe. Perhaps to remember things in a much more intimate manner. And it's okay. You can create your own stories. People have been doing that for the longest time. Now, all of this is fine and made. We understand that, yes, the ancient use stories to remember what these aspects were in the night sky. But does astronomy matter today? What do you think? Definitely. But I think it's not so many maybe books or um, or like we never really or I don't think it's about us. Okay, why do you feel astronomy or space matters? See, I'll be I'll be playing devil's advocate over here right now. I'll, I'm, I'll say that astronomy and space do not matter, although I agree with you, <laughs> but I'm going to be devil's advocate, right? Why do you think astronomy and space matters in this day and age? I mean, we don't need to refer to the stars to give us our directions. Yes. Research, like the moon landings in the USA, NASA, Mars missions. Yes, and we can leave that to the people of science and the scientists to do their work. How does it affect the common man? Why do I be bothered with astronomy and space? Because a lot of the stuff that they created to have these missions, where do you think maybe they use? Yes. Future mining. Again. <laughs> Sorry? Future mining. Future mining. Yes. But again, it would, as... be very, it would be very dark. <laughs> it would be. But here's the thing as a 15 year old, who is constantly, well, not, let's not say constantly, but is mostly on his or her phone. This person does not understand, or does not need to understand, that the technology that they are using is because of space. The file sharing that they're doing, the file compression that they're using, the technology, the satellites that they're using is all because of the space industry. Why does space matter to this 15 year old? Tell us stories to his girlfriend. Sorry? To tell us to the stories. <laughs> so, we are actually very apt when we talk about uh, the fact that major discoveries happened due to the um, advancement for space. The robotic arm was initially developed, which is now used for surgeries was initially developed for space. Uh, the pacemakers were initially developed for space. But then again, how does astronomy affect me? 
And for me, very specifically, it's very simple. In my opinion, astronomy is a subject that changes lives. And the reason I say that is because it changed mine. When Khadija was talking about uh, Mr. Hassan, our CEO, it actually reminded me of the first time that I walked into his office 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, where Mr. Hassan is talking about the size of things in our universe. And I just had a quick chat with him about this aspect, and it blew my mind. I would like to share that. So we look at the universe and we understand that the universe is massive and amazing. But I'd just like to put it into perspective. So to start things off, let's talk about the human size, averaging at 1.6 to 1.8 meters. But let's assume that my height over here is 2 meters which if I'm comparing to the height of this building, which is 10 meters, you need five of me standing on top of each other, which is nothing compared to the tallest building in the world, which is the Burj Khalifa, at 800 meters. You need 80 of these buildings on top of each other. Burj Khalifa is almost nothing compared to the tallest thing on earth, which is Mount Everest which is 8,000 meters. If you are comparing 800 meters to 8,000 meters, you need 10 good solutions. And the problem with 8,000 meters is that it's actually just, just eight kilometers. Some of you have driven more than that to come here today. Because now we're comparing it to the planet Earth, where if you had to walk across the equator, you would have to cover a distance of roughly 44,000 kilometers. Try comparing eight kilometers with 44,000 kilometers. Or a better understanding would be try comparing eight dirhams to 44,000 dirhams. But then again, Earth is just one planet in our array of planets. By the way, quick question. How many planets do we all agree upon right now? Do we have eight or nine? Eight. All right, so we all agree upon eight now. We no longer talk about Pluto. Pluto is something which got disqualified somewhere in 2004. So, when we talk about these eight planets, Earth is not even the largest planet. The largest planet over here is Jupiter, which can host up to 1,300 Earths inside it, which is again not the largest object in our solar system. That goes to the sun, which can take 1.3 million Earths inside it. 99.8% of the entire mass of our solar system belongs to the sun. Everything else that we have ever seen, all the planets, all the asteroids, all the moons, all the cars, all the mountains, all the animals, all the human beings that have ever lived everything just makes up 0.2%. And our sun is just one star, one star in our galaxy, the Milky Way, which is home to, and I'm being conservative over here, more than 400 billion other stars. And our galaxy, is just one galaxy in our universe. Our universe, once again, in a very conservative number, is home to more than 200 billion other galaxies. And this, this is what makes up our universe. I would like to just very quickly share a quick video with you guys. Once again,
So this was basically a visual representation of what I was talking about earlier. But let's just bring it all back. So we've got our universe home to more than 200 billion galaxies, out of which one of them is our galaxy, which has more than 400 billion stars, out of which one of them is our star, the sun, which has eight planets around it, out of which one of those is our planet, Earth, which has seven continents. One of those is Asia. And in Asia, we have a region, Middle East. And in Middle East, we have a country, UAE. And in UAE, we have seven Emirates. One of those is Dubai. And in Dubai, we have a smaller section, Jumeirah. And then we have in Jumeirah, the Emirates Academy for Hospitality. And in that building, in one of the rooms of that building, you and I are talking about size. Where my height is not even two meters. It's around 1.6, I'd like to say 1.7. So what is our size in the universe? And the reality of matter is that it is it's negligible. The universe doesn't care. We don't matter. But I'm not trying to bum you guys out. There is a message. Because there is another side of information that comes over here. Because, yes, while our size in the universe may be nothing, may be negligible, it does teach us a very, very important lesson in humility. 
and we are not the center of the universe. But at the same time, as human beings, we have achieved so much. The Burj Khalifa we are talking about, yeah, we built it. The entire Earth that we are talking about, yes, we've gone across it, and we've gone across it in style. We managed to make metal fly. We now travel from Dubai to New York in 14 to 16 hours, sitting in a chair, watching movie, eating food. This is stuff that even birds can't do. And we didn't stop there. We went beyond our planet. We sent spacecrafts to the entire solar system and beyond. We intend to inhabit Mars as well. And we intend to send spacecrafts to interstellar regions. This is how amazing the human race is. This is how amazing each and every single one of us can be. And my opinion, this is what astronomy truly teaches us. That yes, there is an immense amount of possibilities, immense amount of potential, which is lying beyond our planet where we live. And perhaps one day we'll be able to tap that. I will cut things short because I have taken up way too much time. And I will just very quickly touch the stargazing <laughs> in the UAE and the practical guide. So if you are interested in stargazing, if you are interested in going out and taking a look at the night sky, doing so within the city is a huge challenge. Sure, you can look at the moon, you can look at the planets. These are bright objects. But weirdly enough, tonight, we don't have the moon, nor do we have the planets. I mean, yes, everybody is fascinated about the fact that uh, there is supposed to be a planetary parade, but that is going to happen somewhere around 3 a.m. in the night or early morning, however you'd like to see that. So that is when you will be able to look at Saturn, and you will be able to look at Mars, and if you have a very good telescope, you will be able to look at perhaps Neptune. To be able to do proper stargazing, you want to go out into the desert. You want to go out into a location which has low light pollution. That is what begins to show you the constellations as we saw it. There are areas like Al Qudra in Dubai. There are areas like the Al Quma Desert in Abu Dhabi. There are uh, you have these uh, mountains. Going to these locations with a certain amount of preparation. Um, these are locations that we frequent ourselves. And let me tell you why. The Al Khudra Desert is something which is close. It is accessible. Pretty much anybody can reach it within one hour. And the best part is facilities are nearby. Which means that if you had to go to the washroom or go and grab a bite, you would only have to drive for another 10-15 minutes and you can do so. The al Desert is a fabulous location. This is the place which most people refer to as the Milky Way spot. Very easily accessible in terms of roads. It's quite far away. It's roughly around three, three and a half hours. Water and your closest facilities are roughly around 45 minutes away from you. So if you are going to this location, go well prepared. We interchange between these based on what we're looking for. If we are looking for uh, deep space objects, if we want to see the Milky Way, if we want to uh, photograph the Milky Way, we would be going to the Hua Desert. But if we are hosting a uh, program, for a large number of people, we generally go to the Al Qudra Desert. Finally, we have our Jabal Jis in Ras Al Khaimah, where even in the heat of the summer, the temperature is quite pleasant. We've had uh, the Barsid's meteor shower in August on the Jabal Jis. As a matter of fact, I think this is a photo from that. That's my car. Um, so we had temperatures of roughly around 
between 25 to 30 degrees. Very comfortable. Um, dry, but very comfortable. So uh, we had a fabulous stargazing session up over there in the middle of uh, the summer. And it really didn't feel that way. Now, tips for a successful stargazing experience. I would generally recommend that your first stargazing experience be with a group such as ourselves, where um, you are going there with somebody who knows what the sky is going to be like. They've got their equipment with them. So if you are participating in a stargazing experience with us, we generally have our equipment. We bring telescopes. We've got mats. We set up a snack station. Water is available. All the works are available. However, following that, you have a good enough idea as to where to go and what to expect. So even if you were to go to uh, one of these areas, which I've uh, mentioned earlier, without any equipment and just uh, a mat, some drinking water, perhaps some snacks, you are good to go. I would advise that you take along with you some of these um, very easily accessible. You could buy them off on Amazon. You don't have to get very flashy. The binoculars, they are a ton of fun to use and hunt for celestial objects. You can also use mobile phone apps, which point out where the object that you are looking for is. And using the binoculars, going with the family, going with friends, makes it a fabulous experience. Many people have done that, and they uh, come back to us with glowing reviews. And yes, um, not that we've ever needed to, but I do recommend carrying a first aid kit because if you're out in the desert, you want to be careful with uh, what lies there. And you guys know about that much more than we do. So yes, with that, I would like to hand things over to Khadija. Khadija, really sorry I took a lot of your time. Um, no worries at all. I will try to summarize the entire UAE space sector in 10 minutes. So That's let's get started. So everything that is going on in the UAE space sector currently and all of the future plans. Let's go to the next one. So the UAE's vision for space exploration right now is that they would like to make, they would like to basically get in the space race. So we are trying to do quite a lot of things from going to Mars, from going to the moon, to making the lunar gateway, which is with NASA, a lot of things from scientific advancement, global collaboration, working with the youth, getting a lot of the youth into this, into the space sector is a huge goal, which is where we come in handy, <laughs> teaching a lot of the people to get into the sector and basically getting the whole next generation to push this and take us to where we need to go. Go to the next one. So there is quite a lot of missions. I had a video to show, but I feel like we're just gonna skim through all of it. So a lot of the missions that have been happening recently and a lot of upcoming really exciting missions that are there. So. One of the main missions, which is after, uh, with the leadership of uh, Sheikh Mohammed, uh, he announced that we would like to build a scientific city on Mars. So uh, there is a, the project 2117, which is the long-term goal to establish a whole city where people could actually live in Mars by the year 2170. I'm assuming none of us would be there. <laughs> to enjoy this, but I hope that we could have some sort of a, I guess, thumb or a footprint or something in that project. The scientific city as well that they would like to build there. So quite a lot of exciting projects that we won't be there for, unfortunately, but really hope that we could do something today that would help build that city in the future. Then we have yeah. the Emirates Mars mission, the Hope Probe, as we all heard and have seen and which is by the way, currently still active. It is going orbiting around Mars and it is uh, basically getting all of the data about the atmosphere and the climate. Then we have the Emirates Lunar Mission, 
which started with a Rashid rover, which they have sent last year. Unfortunately, it crashed. So they are planning to send another one very soon. It's going to be called Rashid rover 2. So really hope that that works out. And the main plans of getting back to the moon is to build the Lunar Gateway, which is a project that they're working on with NASA. It's basically going to be somewhat of a stop for us to reach further things, hopefully go to Mars as well. Instead of just going from the Earth, we will start going from the moon. And then lastly, but not least, we have the Asteroid Belt Mission, which is coming up hopefully in a couple of years. They <laughs> hopefully be able to launch. So they're planning to launch a MBR rover, which is going to carry a lander that is, uh, well, the rover is going to pass by seven asteroids in the asteroid belt between Jupiter and Mars. And the last uh, asteroid, which is the biggest one, it's called Justitia, something like that. So that asteroid, yeah. So they are planning to land a lander on that asteroid and learn about it see what we can get. Hopefully the lander that they built is able to bring some samples back. I don't know if that is possible with the plans that they have, but hopefully they can. We were also part of, we had a competition uh, earlier, you know, late last year, where they were asking anybody to build or design landers for them. And we did one as well. We don't know what happened with that competition, but. We have a lander in case anybody needs to use it. <laughs> Let's go to the next slide. So the key organizations right now in the UAE space sector. So we have the UAE Space Agency established in 2014. These are the uh, government agency. They regulate, they have all of the policies. They are above everything and they are sort of the people who regulate the laws and everything regarding space. Then we have the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center, which if you guys have been to Mushrik Park, they are right next to us outside. So these guys were founded in 2016. This is under the patronage of Sheikh Hamdan, and he is the CEO of this space center. And they are the guys who are responsible for sending people to space. They do a lot of research. They've sent satellites, the Khalifa Sad, the uh, uh, Dubai Sat, and a lot of other ones. And they were, they were basically the guys who are sending all the people to space. So all the astronauts are coming from their astronaut space, uh, astronaut program. Then we have the Al-Sadim Observatory, which is in Abu Dhabi that you guys can visit. So this is a private observatory in Abu Dhabi funded by the government. They do a lot of outreach programs. Then you have us, Dubai Astronomy Group, as you guys know. And then you have in Sharjah, you have the Sharjah Academy for Astronomy and Space Sciences. These guys are part of the Sharjah University, and they do a lot of research. They do a lot of outreach programs as well, and they work with a lot of students just teaching about uh, all of the things that they're doing. They've also sent out a satellite. Don't remember what it's called, though, <laughs> but I think they have. And then lastly, we have the Emirates Astronomical Society, which is also in Abu Dhabi, and these are a nonprofit organization also working towards promoting astronomy in the UAE. Go to the next one. So all of the satellites that they have launched from Dubai, from the UAE. So we have the Dubai Sat 1, Dubai Sat 2. Both of these were Earth observation ones. One of them is inactive. One of them is still going on. Then we have all of the Yassat uh, satellites. These were by the telecommunications company, Al Yassat, which is in Abu Dhabi. These guys are responsible for three satellites, I think more than that, but three satellites mentioned here, all of which are still active. Then we have the Khalifa Sat, which was also from the MBRS, the Mohammed bin Rashid Center. This is an Earth observation one. Then we have the Hope Probe, which is orbiting Mars, as we can see in the image here. Then we recently have the Knife One, which is an educational one sent by students, and then we have the Mezen Sat, also environmental monitoring set that it's uh, by the UAE Space Agency. Then we have all of our astronauts. So we have Kurt now, he is the Minister of Youth 
His Excellency Sultan Al Miyadi. Then we have Hazar Al Mansouri, the first astronaut who went to space. And we have the future astronauts, Noor Al Matrushi and Muhammad Al Mullah. Now, his Excellency Sultan, he was actually part of the Crew 6 mission that went last year for six months. He was he was in space for the longest uh, time. So six months he spent in the International Space Station. Then we have Hazar who was there for eight days in space. First astronaut to go so and to go to the ISS. And then we have the future astronauts who are also planning to go to the ISS as well as part of Crew 7 or nine, one of them. We are also going with NASA or SpaceX. <laughs> Go to the next one. So how can you guys get involved? If you are interested, how can you contribute to the space sector? First of all, participation in all of these events. As you guys are here today, you are contributing to the space sector. Uh, participating in any sorts of events that are happening around the UAE. There are quite a lot of events going on, either by us or by any of the other organizations that I mentioned. Joining our events, we have memberships, we have volunteering opportunities where anybody from kids to adults can join us to learn more about these events. Anybody who volunteers with us as well, they usually learn everything. So how to use telescopes, how to be a part of these events. Then we have educational opportunities in case anybody's interested in broadening their scientific knowledge about this from workshops to courses. All of this will be available in our website, dubaiastronomy.com. So anything that you guys would be interested in, we are more than happy to help you guys. Go to the next one. And then we have all of the upcoming events this year. So we have asteroid day, moon day, these are not celestial events, these are just events that are happening. Then we have the Buck Supermoon. So this is when the moon is the closest to Earth. It's gonna appear much bigger <laughs> and it's gonna be a full moon. So we are gonna do a big event for that. Hopefully you guys can come as well. We have the conjunction of Jupiter and Mars, the, another supermoon, uh, lunar occultation of Saturn, which I don't know what that is. Shiraz can tell you. <laughs> So basically, it would seem as if um, Saturn is coming out from behind the moon. Oh, so it's the opposite of that other oh, conjunction. Okay. That is conjunction. Okay, so then we have Saturn at opposition. We have a penumbral lunar eclipse, which it's nothing big. It is somewhat of an eclipse, but nothing really is going to be that visible. But that same day, we also have a supermoon. Then we have the space week. Yet another two more two more supermoons, and then we end it with the Jupiter opposition. These are events that are visible anywhere in Dubai. So whether you're in the city, whether you're in the desert, you will be able to see all of these. We have uh, the Perseids meteor shower and the Gemini's meteor shower as well. Perseids happens in uh, August 12th. Gemini happens around December 14th. And both of these events, you have to be in very dark locations to be able to see that. All of these, including the meteor showers, we will be doing events for. So anybody would like to join us for that, you're more than welcome. <laughs> and with that, we will end our session. Any questions, we are more than happy to answer. And you can connect with us through our email and our phone number. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> No questions. Side no question. Yes. I have a lot of questions, large, large and small, but let me start with one. You, 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 you took us back to the early days of astronomy, but you yeah. took us back to a point when. Uh, everyday people looking at the sky recognized that there was a, uh, a celestial star calendar uh, and they counted from that you mentioned 100 days, 100 days 100 days attacking on do you do you or, or have scholars thought about 
why it, why it is that with that background understanding, why instead of a celestial calendar, a lunar calendar became the standard for so many cultures? So um, if you notice in the, the celestial calendar or this in uh, is very similar to the solar calendar because again we are still following the three hundred sixty five days. The lunar calendar actually helped you divide things up into months, and uh, it became the observation of the moon is something which is viable and visible to everybody everywhere. So the lunar calendar in this case became more prominent in some cultures. That's all I have. That's all the information that I have about this. But uh, there could be other reasons which I am not aware of. Yes. Yes. Uh, many years, uh, you told about several versions about how uh, different uh, generations uh, ancient, of ancient people comprehended the stars, but you didn't tell about one thing which I have placed pretty uh, much in pretty my life. Now, I had assisted to one. Uh, translator from Sumerian language. And he made a, a reconstruction of the, uh, the star uh, st uh, skies, uh, the sky. And I, wrote, uh, I just drawn for him all this map, which was pretty big, yeah, with all Sumerian names, you know, with all the transliterations. And then he told me what should he think. That Sumerians comprehend the stars, not like a fig figures of the uh, you know animals or something like that, but as the heads of beheaded persons. Each star is the head of the beheaded person. <laughs> you never heard about the same. I have not heard about this. Yes. Although I was aware of the fact that, uh, like the Babylonians as well, the Sumerians were um, also again. It would be very, very, very fair to say that every civilization that we come across, that we read about, that we know about, have their own versions of astronomy. This software itself uh, lets you see that as well, and it gives you an insight into those stories. But um, the heads of uh, people, this is definitely some new information for me. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yes, it's published uh, 30 years ago. Fabulous. I need to update myself on that. Yes. Any other questions? Could the guy, I wonder about Gary's question about the moon, could the fact of, uh, that the moon has such a direct impact, so does the sun, but Jupiter doesn't have an impact on us really. The moon does because of tides, if people realize that, the sea and tides and is that something that maybe the moon also took your gravity attention? I would I wouldn't be able to say. I'm guessing yes, that could also be one of the reasons. But uh, the only one thing which is coming to my mind as of now is see, for example, when we look at the Islamic calendar, right? The Islamic calendar is a lunar calendar. And what it uh, states is that you go out on the 29th of the current month to take a look and look for the new moon. If you don't find it, go back home. Very simple. It's a very clear and visual uh, element that if you see it, fine. The month is going to be 29 days. The existing month that you were in, you saw the new moon, end of story, now you have entered the new month. However, if you don't see the new moon, go back home, it's going to be 30 days, and that is the end of it. You don't even have to go on the 30th uh, day to observe. So based on this information, 
is the only reason why I'm saying that the moon is uh, very obvious. I don't know whether I'm assuming that they did also understand how the moon is affecting the tides. Because um, the ancients that we, when we read about some of the stuff that they have done, it is surprising to know that they achieved so much without the technology that we have and we are pretty much squandering in the sense that, very simply said, the when the uh, Americans put the man on the moon, they had less computational power than we have in one single mobile phone. So even though they didn't have the technology, it's not like they were not smart people. They were exceptionally smart people. You look at what um, the Astrolab, you look at the uh, works of uh, Aristoteles, who actually just by the distance of walking from, if I'm not mistaken, Alexandria to Cairo, and and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but the distance of walking between two cities in Egypt, this gentleman mapped out what the uh, diameter of the earth would be. And he was Aristotle, yes. And, uh, he, and when it was calculated properly, he was off by just a little bit like a negligible margin. So these were amazing minds. One, okay. One of the questions that we normally get uh, about is how do we know how far this star is? And uh, one of the oldest methods that was used is referred to as, if I'm not mistaken, the stellar parallax, where what they are doing is they are observing a star from one point on Earth, and they're measuring their angle of observation. And then, they look at that same star six months later because now they're on the opposite side of the sun and they measure their angle of observation and they've got themselves a triangle. They've already figured out what the distance to the sun is. I'm not sure how they did that, but I'm assuming a similar manner, but they've got themselves a triangle and using trigonometry to all those kids who are wondering when they're going to use it, Using trigonometry, they find out the distance to uh, the stars, which are light years away. So yeah, these uh, people who, uh, the ancients that we talked about, sure, they might not have had the technology that we do, but it's not like they did not understand things or they weren't smart. So to answer your question, yes, that might have been one of the reasons as to why they selected the moon or went with that. Any other questions? Yes. They could talk about let's say using triangulation. There's also been some bouncing experiments, bouncing signals of, of the moon or Jupiter. There's been a Netflix series about using sun to accelerate the communication. Can you talk a bit about the bouncing? Because Netflix is just a vicious one. I'm not aware of the uh, sun or the mutation. Khadija, what do you have on this? You watch Netflix a lot more than I do. But um, there is. The is to get a book out of sync. The bouncing is a more real, realistic scenario. So the bouncing of Jupiter, talk about that to explain what they're trying to do. So um, there is the concept, and I don't know if this is. Anyway, we didn't want to talk about it, but there is the concept of developing solar sails where um, they're talking about developing satellites for interstellar travel that will be pushed forth using sails that react to photons. So, photons are basically pushing these sails into a specific direction. The beauty of our space is that once you put an object, it just kind of starts going. So this should accelerate um, space travel. However, in terms of bouncing of uh, light, that is definitely one of the things that uh, is done with the moon. I'm not aware if it is done with Jupiter because I don't know how they would bounce it off Jupiter. But the reason why they can bounce it off the moon is because when the astronauts uh, of the Apollo mission went to the moon 
they actually left behind mirrors for this specific reason that they would uh, bounce off lasers off those mirrors and kind of uh, measure the distance, measure the time in as to how much, how long it takes light to travel from point A to B and back. So that is uh, another thing I'm not aware of. Maybe which I've seen proposals about gaining understanding of the contents of asteroids. Thing which comes to mind, but I didn't know the details. That's what I was curious. Intense of asteroid travel, pretty much studied by radios. <laughs> I could be completely ignorant about this. I will definitely look it up. Yes, any other questions? Going once. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much. You know, like me. Thank you, thank you uh, very much to uh, uh, Shiraz and uh, Khadija and for introducing some of us to, you know, we're always surprised when we've been around for decades and we always find when new people don't find us or don't know what we've been involved in, but I don't think uh, all of us realize uh, uh, what all you've been, uh, been doing. You, know, uh, you actually have people who are Using your uh, uh, the the center at uh, Mushroom Park for the research projects. I know that recent recent uh, asteroids. There are amateur astronomers who've got their names attached to these things. That's in a way that's old style because they're still using visuals to do it. They're not using uh, uh, fancy uh, different light things. You, you have research? So before the center got temporarily closed, uh, we were actually doing that for asteroids from our uh, main observatory. And there were people that were uh, joining hands with uh, our observatory astronomers. However, we are going to uh, once again restart that because there are a lot of opportunities for citizen scientist uh, elements where people can join hands and be part of real research and real science and not just on the lines of, yeah, this is something that we enjoy, but they're practically part of it. We do work with uh, schools in terms of developing uh, concepts like weather stations where they too are actively collecting that data and uh, they can publish that data as well. And we are developing tools that can be made accessible to every single person very conveniently that allows them to set up these uh, data collection centers, if you might want to call it, um, at their homes. And that allows everybody to be able to collect scientific data. Thank you very much. Our pleasure. Uh, I think we, we... Well, we've offered you a, a selection of books here and you've worked on that. Uh, and uh, thanks to, uh, this, there was something I was trying to remember for the end of this. Anyway, it's, it is the end of, it's the end of our season for several months. Uh, we will be picking up the thanks to uh, Michelle has already got us set, although she's not going to be uh, formally in action. She's got us set uh, for the first couple of months and we'll be seeing in September, Dr. Ada Natoli from the UAE Dolphin Project will be reporting on a lot of their work, the major results of their work over the last, I think it's been about eight years since Ada has actually spoken uh, to us. So we'll be interested in hearing that. So I look forward to seeing you all in September. I'm not certain if I'll be here in person, but we'll see you then. And thanks very much to the Dubai Astronomy Group for joining us this evening and introducing us to what they're doing with some very thoughtful uh, stuff. I particularly, I love the scale thing. You can read these things, but to see it uh, just expand. I know the names of some of the stars, but to now, now I think of them <laughs> differently. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.